The 2003 movie Finding Nemo popularized the symbiotic relationship between clownfish and sea anemones. But despite having known about this relationship for more than 150 years, scientists still aren't sure exactly how it works. Today, we're visiting the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago to find Nemo for ourselves. Clownfish are native to the shallow reefs of the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Being just a little over three inches in length, they would make a tasty snack for many larger fish, but clownfish find protection in the tentacles of sea anemones. My search for Nemo brought me to the wild reef but it was actually Dory who showed up first. But just a little further down the exhibit, we found Nemo, safe at home in his anemone. Although they might not look like it, anemones are animals. They are sessile, meaning that they spend most of their life stuck in one place. The anemone's fleshy foot, or basal disc, anchors it to a solid surface. Anemones feed by letting their tentacles drift in the current. When unsuspecting prey brush against the tentacles, the anemone grabs them, injects paralyzing venom, and pulls them down into its mouth. Anemones inject venom via nematocysts. These special stinging organelles line the anemone's tentacles. The nematocysts are like little loaded guns. On the outside of the capsules is a trigger. The trigger can be pulled either by pressure or chemical detection and inside the nematocyst is a long, harpoon-like filament. When a creature touches the anemone, it accidentally pulls the triggers and is shot by hundreds of tiny harpoons. The filaments pierce the animal's skin and inject venom. But unlike other fish, clownfish can safely swim through these venomous tentacles, and this allows them to live in a symbiotic relationship with these very dangerous anemones. The main benefit which the anemone provides is protection. Hungry predators can't get at a clownfish when they're safe inside the anemone's tentacles. But what gives clownfish their special ability to brush up against the anemone without harm? Well, it turns out that clownfish are protected by a layer of mucus that covers their body. This mucus lacks certain chemical compounds which trigger the firing of those nematocysts. We still don't know exactly how this system works. Some clownfish are innately protected against anemones, while others need to slowly acclimate to the presence of the anemone before they can safely touch it. And some scientists believe that the transfer of microbes from the anemone to the clownfish might play a role in protecting it. So clownfish do several things. One is that they actually scare off predatory fish that eat anemones, such as butterfly fish. And clownfish, for their size, are quite aggressive. They're, they're quite small, but they can bite and scare off other fish, which are predators of the anemone. Uh, another thing that they do is they sometimes will try to get food and bring it back to the anemone. Now we don't know that they're actually trying to feed the anemone, but they're trying to store food. And as a result, they actually end up sharing food with the anemone. Clownfish also help out their sea anemone by, um, well, uh, peeing on them. Urine is a good source of nitrogen, and anemones need nitrogen for another relationship that they're in. There's another dimension to the relationship between clownfish and sea anemones, and that is these photosynthetic algae. Since the earliest stages of development, sea anemones actually have algae living inside of their tissues. And so when they grow, these algae grow with them and actually provide them with their photosynthate or their sugars and other organic molecules that they make. So the sea anemones get nutritional benefit from having these algae live inside of them. And the growth of these algae is dependent on nitrogen. Anemones that are in a relationship with a clownfish can host more algae because of the extra nitrogen they receive. Anemones appear to carefully regulate the growth of their algae. They allow them to grow in some parts of their body and make chemicals that kill them off in other parts. And the anemone actually appears to be communicating with the algae. There seems to be some sort of chemical signaling going on between them. This signaling allows the anemone to expand and contract its tentacles to control the amount of light that the algae are exposed to, to make sure that they get the optimum conditions for performing photosynthesis. 
The symbiotic relationship between the clownfish and anemone is fascinating, and there's so many different levels of complexity. Whether you're looking at how these two animals interact with each other, or how their relationship affects and is affected by microscopic life forms. And it all makes you wonder, how did such a complex and intertwined relationship develop? Did God create the clownfish and anemone in a symbiotic relationship? I don't think we have a very good understanding yet of exactly how this symbiotic relationship developed. but. If you claim that God miraculously created this symbiotic relationship, I think that you run into a number of different problems. First, we need to consider what the benefit of such a relationship would have been in a world without death. Before the fall, clownfish must not have had any predators. But if there were no predators, the clownfish would have been safe even without the anemone. And the anemone wouldn't have needed the protection provided by the clownfish either. The anemone's protective capabilities really only make sense in a fallen world, because presumably the anemone would not have had venom before the fall. Second, God probably did not create clownfish in the beginning, so they can't have been in a symbiotic relationship. Clownfish are likely members of a much larger created kind. In other words, they're related to lots of other fish, such as damselfish, that are not immune to anemones. In fact, the various species of clownfish may gain immunity in different ways. Certain species of clownfish can only live in symbiosis with certain anemone species. The ability of the clownfish to come into physical contact with the anemone is likely the result of genetic changes over time. Studies have found that clownfish may have experienced positive selection of genes related to symbiosis. And these genes produce enzymes that remove excitable substances from their mucous coat, basically purifying it so that it doesn't trigger a response from the anemone. Now we don't know whether this is the result of random mutations or possibly some sort of targeted mutations. Much more research is needed, especially from a creationist perspective, to understand the pathway to this symbiotic relationship. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it and perhaps even learned something from it. If you did, make sure to like and subscribe so that you'll see our upcoming videos. And also, make sure to share this video with your friends who might be interested. Thanks. So just then, the sea cucumber looks over the mollusk and says, With fronds like these, who needs anemones? <laughs>